On July 20th, 1969, the story begins in the house of astronaut Jim Lovell. Jim and many other NASA families have assembled to see Apollo 11's moonwalk. Later, Jim thinks on how close he came to landing on the moon while orbiting it on Apollo 8, and fantasizes of one day stepping foot on the moon while his wife Marilyn tries not to think about her husband leaving on another mission. Some months later, Jim learns that because to an ear infection suffered by one of the Apollo 13 crew members, he and his crew colleagues have been appointed to the mission's prime crew. Marilyn is concerned about the shortened schedule and the fact that the mission number is 13, but Jim is convinced they'll be ready. Jim works with his crewmates Fred Hayes and Ken Mattingly, and the three appear to be well prepared for their task. Marilyn expresses her concerns about the flight to Jim just before launch, but Jim tells her that she will miss a great show. Following their discussion, Jim and his crewmates hold a short press conference to highlight the various ways that the number 13 has been included into the launch. Apollo 13, launching at 1300 hours and 13 minutes, and orbiting the moon on April 13th. Jim also surprises the journalists and the crew by announcing that this will be his final mission. The flight surgeon reports that a member of the backup crew has measles, and the prime crew has been exposed to it just days before the mission. The flight surgeon believes that because Ken Mattingly has never had the measles, he is at high risk of being ill during the flight. Jim is then offered the option of having Ken Mattingly replaced by his backup, Jack Swigert, or having the entire Apollo 13 crew pushed back to a later mission. Despite his dissatisfaction with the options, Jim chooses to replace Ken. When Jack gets summoned, he delighted, but Ken is distraught when both Jim and Fred inform him. The team continues to train with Swigert in the simulator, though they are not as confident in Jack's piloting abilities as Ken is. Nonetheless, Jim vows that they will be ready for the launch. On the day of the launch, Ken stands back and watches the rocket lift off from a safe distance, with Marilyn Lovell and Fred Hayes's wife Mary in attendance at the launch site. Marilyn and Mary are relieved when the Saturn V rocket carrying their husbands successfully launches into orbit. Swigert's piloting talents allow the crew to successfully connect the command module with the LEM, Lunar Excursion Module. The crew also sends a video of themselves inside the craft, but owing to the perception that moon trips are no longer thrilling, none of the television networks broadcast it. The crew performs some housekeeping chores on the ship shortly after the video stream, and Jim Swigert is requested to stir the oxygen tanks. A huge blast is heard, and the spacecraft begins to tip out of control, with system buttons lighting up and oxygen tanks failing. Gene Kranz's mission goes into action, seeking to resolve the issue from the ground. In the midst of the chaos, Lovell reports that the service module is leaking oxygen. It is proposed by ECOM member Cy Liebergott to turn off the fuel cells to prevent additional leaking. However, if the fuel cells are closed, they cannot be reopened, and the moon landing will not take place. Jim Lovell is wary of the operation, but the crew goes ahead with it, only for the oxygen level in the command module to plummet further. With just 15 minutes of oxygen left in the command module, an emergency transfer is performed to move the flight computer's information and the astronauts onto the LEM, which will serve as a lifeboat. The crew completes the three-hour power-up operation for the LEM in record time, relying on data from the Odyssey's flight computer and assistance from the mission control ground crew to double-check their course heading. The crew is eventually secured in the LEM, and control is returned to the Odyssey, where Gene Kranz and his men seek to figure out the best approach to get the men home. While some argue for a direct abort, having the crew turn the ship around and return to Earth immediately, using the command module, Gene thinks it's too risky to start the ship's engine, since they don't know how much the explosion that was reported has harmed the craft. The goal is for the crew to be slingshot around by the moon's gravity, and then they'll start up the LM's engine to return them home. The LM's designers warned that their ship was not meant for what is being proposed, let alone holding three men instead of two. Nonetheless, Gene argues that it is the only viable option. Meanwhile, Marilyn Lovell tries to remain calm and strong for her family. NASA media representative Henry Hunt asks Marilyn if the news stations may set up an antenna on her 
her front lawn at one point. She flatly refuses, stating that they may speak with Jim once he returns home. The crew of the ship travels to the dark side of the moon and then circles it. Though Hayes and Swigert are delighted to view their landing location below and Jim fantasizes about his own stroll on the moon's surface, Jim warns them that they must still prepare to return home. During this time, the men at Mission Control have concluded that the craft has just 45 hours of power left, which is insufficient to return them home. John Aaron corrects this information, claiming that they are utilizing more power than the calculations predicted and that it will be depleted in 15 hours. According to John, the team must turn off practically everything, including their navigational computer, and reduce power use to 12 amps. Gene agrees but instructs the others to conduct further study, including simulator time to work on a re-entry power-up technique. Ken Mattingly, who had been isolated at home and had missed all of the news about the mission's failure, is summoned and begins simulator work. Ken believes that if they can eliminate unnecessary operations from the checklist, he will be able to bring the men back with the minimal power they have. He instructs the simulator team to provide him with the same circumstances and equipment as the Odyssey crew, and begins working long hours without breaks to develop a process. Shortly later, it is discovered that all three guys in the LEM are utilizing more oxygen and creating more carbon dioxide than planned. Fred Hayes finds he made a mistake while calculating oxygen supplies for only himself and Jim because they would be the only two using the LEM. The ground crew notices that the LEM filters are round, although the only other filters on board for the command module are square. A crew is formed to develop a filtering system using the craft's limited materials. The team is working hard to create a new filter. On the spaceship, the crew has a brief argument when Jack mentions a distant re-entry factor and Fred claims that Jack triggered the mishap by stirring the oxygen tanks. Lovell convinces them both that arguing and blaming each other would get them nowhere. They receive a call from Houston, warning them to an oxygen problem just as the CO2 saturation light illuminates, and they work quickly to construct the filter that the ground crew designed. The procedure is successful, and the filter cleans the ship's air supply. When it is determined that the crew must perform a manual burn to correct their trajectory back to Earth, Jim and the crew time a difficult 30-second burn using only rudimentary physics. The course computer had to be turned off to conserve battery power, and they can only navigate by keeping the Earth positioned in one of the LEM's windows. The burn is successful because all three work together to steer the ship. Jim and the crew are ready for the power-up procedure now that their route has been adjusted, but they are told that it is still being completed. When Mission Control reports that Ken Mattingly is working on the situation, there is some optimism. The team feels cold since the heaters have to be turned off, and Hayes becomes unwell and develops a mild fever. Ken has done his best to streamline his work, but the procedure is still running four amps over. Ken then suggests that part of the extra power in LEM be reversed into the command module. Though power will be lost during the transfer, the amperage required is found to be sufficient to finish the process without causing the system to lose power. Ken and his colleagues rush to mission control with the method. Ken assists the weary Jack Swigert with the power-up, while Jim and Fred add ballast to the command module pod, which is underweight due to the mission's intended addition of moon rock samples. With Ken's assistance, Jack reactivates the Odyssey's systems. The servicing module is then jettisoned from the spacecraft by the crew. As it floats away, astronauts film and comment on what they see. A complete panel of the ship was blasted out, perhaps damaging the heat shield of the command module pod, raising the possibility that Odyssey won't be able to withstand the extreme heat of re-entry into Earth's atmosphere. The LEM is eventually released, and the crew prepares for re-entry. For a brief period, Jack believes Jim will pilot the Odyssey himself, but Jim quickly relinquishes control, explaining that he had merely sat in the pilot's seat out of habit. Meanwhile, many people across the world are waiting to discover if the three men will survive. Marilyn's friends and family gather at her home to watch the news. Contact is lost as the men begin their re-entry, and a countdown to three minutes, the usual time it takes astronauts to awaken from blackout, begins. When Ken Mattingly radios the crew after three minutes, no response is received. The countdown then reaches four and a half minutes before Jim Lovell's voice is heard and a visual feed shows the spacecraft with its parachutes deployed. The guys are quickly retrieved and boarded the USS Iwo Jima, much to the delight of the crew. Jim says in a voiceover that their mission was termed a successful failure since they returned safely but did not reach the moon. It is also revealed that the cause of the explosion was a faulty coil in the exploding oxygen tank, which had been assessed to be a minor defect two years before Lovell was appointed captain of the ship. Fred Hayes was supposed to be on Apollo 18, 
but his mission was canceled due to budget concerns. Jack Swigert left NASA to run for Congress in Colorado, but he died of cancer before taking office. Ken Mattingly piloted the space shuttle and orbited the moon as the command module pilot of Apollo 16, who also never gotten the measles. Gene Kranz stepped down as mission control chief in the mid-1990s. According to news reports, Jim's tenure on Apollo 13 was his final space mission. Nonetheless, he expects that NASA will return to the moon one day.